Welcome to another video on The Fossil Record. My name is Benjamin Brigger, and in this video, I want to talk about a strange and mysterious fossil first discovered in South Dakota, Egmuwishashawala. Egmuwishashawala. It's a great name <laughs> for a fossil. This photograph is of three important American paleontologists in the early 20th century. In the center is wealthy Henry Fairfield Osborne, founding director of the Paleontology Division of the American Museum of Natural History in New York, who coined the name of the iconic Trinosaurus Rex. But flanking him on either side are his two chief fossil collectors, Walter Granger and Alfred Thompson. Now together, Walter and Alfred explored much of the interior of the United States in the late 1890s and early 1900s, mostly on horseback and wagon. And in 1906, they led a major expedition into the badlands of South Dakota for the museum. It was only 16 years after the massacre at Wounded Knee, and the region between the Missouri and the North Platte Rivers had been transformed in the aftermath of a long and extremely bloody war between the native peoples of the region and the United States military. Beginning in 1868, the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota people, also known as the Sioux, had been fighting for their, their existence. At the conclusion of the war in 1890, the people had been forced into a fragmentary reservation system, and forced into encampments, or sent off to boarding schools. And these reservations are scattered across South Dakota, include the Standing Rock, the Pine Ridge, and the Rosebud Indian Reservations of South Dakota. At the center of this region are a vast swath of badlands, outcroppings of rocks, that date from the Eocene, Oligocene, and Miocene. Rich in fossil bones of mammals, the region was a beckoning place for Walter and Alfred to explore for fossils. In 1906, with special permission from the Pine Ridge and Rosebud Indian agencies, the American Museum was able to visit the area and collect fossils, hoping to determine the boundary between the Oligocene and Miocene epochs. The Miocene of North America is recognized as the first appearance of the elephant-like animals, the proboscideans, while the older Eocene was recognized as having the gigantic titanotheres, like brontops. The Oligocene, on the other hand, between the two was poorly sampled, but contained a diversity of horses, rhinos, and camels. Now, the goal of the expedition was to determine the age of these rock layers and collect fossils for the museum and help clarify the stratigraphic boundaries between the Eocene, Oligocene, and Miocene epochs of the Cenozoic. The team never did find any fossil proboscideans. All the suspected fossil elephant tusks ended up being um, ribs of rhinos or coming from the overburden of the Pleistocene gravels. So it has been determined that these rock layers are only Eocene and Oligocene in age. Now today, the rocks um, in South Dakota's Badlands are part of Badlands National Park. And, and they're divided below into the uh, late Eocene Shadron Formation and above into the Oligocene uh, Brule Formation and Sharps Formation. Now the Badlands of South Dakota is one of the best exposures across the Eocene Oligocene boundary where a major climatic shift occurred, leading to a much colder planet Earth around 34 million years ago. This boundary separates the hothouse world of the Eocene from the icehouse world of the Oligocene. Now this climate event resulted in what is called the Grand Coupier, the, the, the big cut, a major transition into a colder and more frozen northern hemisphere, similar to you know, what we have today. In both North America and across Europe, uh, during this time period, primate species became extinct, such as the lemur-like adapids and the tarsier-like omomyids. They just vanish 
from the fossil record after the Eocene. Now, despite the fact that they survive today and live in the much warmer and tropical regions of Africa and Southeast Asia, the cold climate of the Oligocene resulted in habitat loss of semi-tropical forests across the, the Northern Hemisphere, and primates were vanquished from North America. Walter and Alfred would continue to collect fossils from the region for the next 35 years. But one morning in the summer of 1941, while on an expedition to the Badlands collecting fossils, Alfred awoke from his tent to find that Walter had passed away in his sleep. It was a sad shock to poor Alfred, as the two fossil collectors had spent their entire careers together uh, and lives together on many, many expeditions around the world. Um, Alfred then had to transport Walter's body to, to Denver uh, so he could cremate him before carrying his friend's uh, ashes uh, back to his family in New York City. It was the end of a legacy but despite all of their work in collecting fossils for years and years, they, they never found this ultra-rare fossil. That discovery would come from someone else. That same year, in October of 1941, a young recruit named James McDonald had just joined the Army. Now, James had studied geology in his home state of California, um, but the attack on Pearl Harbor in December had forced him into the Army, and he had started his training at Fort Benning in Georgia for service overseas. Interested in rocks and fossils, James now found himself as the commander of forces in the South Pacific Theater in New Guinea and in the Philippines. After the war, um, James returned home to teach geology in California and took a position in 1949 uh, at the Museum of Geology at South Dakota School of Mines and Technology in Rapid City, South Dakota. He was introduced to the incredible wealth of fossil mammals from these badlands, and he picked up where uh, Walter and Alfred had left off before World War II, finding fossils in these mid-Cenozoic rock layers. James collected fossils for 10 years, um, and most of his work focused on the younger uh, Oligocene Sharps formation that Alfred and Walter had somewhat neglected, and at the time was still thought to be Miocene in age. And in 1963, he published his monograph of the fossils recovered from the Badlands for the museum in South Dakota. And included in this collection were three specimens of fossilized teeth that he had trouble identifying. Now, the best specimen is a lower jaw with four well-preserved teeth, two premolars and two molars. They appear not to belong to a marsupial, although they show some similarities, but it was determined that they contained three rather than four molars. The fourth premolar superficially resembled a molar. This is a strange trait. The molars did not have the wear patterns or cusps found in rodents and rabbits, which were much more common in the rocks, and the jaw was too small to be an ungulate or an oreodont, um, and too large to be a, an insectivore, and it lacked the carnassial teeth of carnivores. The specimen compared best with a much older Eocene primate called Washakius from the Middle Eocene of Wyoming and Colorado, a primate with a very crenulated or wrinkled teeth. Had he discovered a primate that had survived the great extinction? In these layers of rock, directly below the location of the fossil locality is a volcanic ash. It's called the Rocky Ford Ash. Um, which is dated radiometrically at 30 million years old. That's an Oligocene age for this fossil locality. If these fossils represented pr a primate, 
then these primates had survived the great climatic uh, event for at least four million years into, into the early Oligocene um, and were younger than 30 million years old. Now, James McDonald named the fossil Egmuwasashawala <laughs> and placed it within the primates in the same family as Washakius as a member of the Omomi, Omomayid, uh family of primates. Now the name is from the local language of the Lakota people and ekmo, ekmo means cat, uh, washashala means washasha means uh, man and the la uh, is the diminutive suffix for the for small for being small. Um, so it literally translates as little cat man or as a way to denote a monkey or primate in the local language. So the species binomial was named after a son, Philo. So the name of the species is Egmowasashla Philotol, uh, meaning Philo's little cat man in Lakota. A few years later, a beautiful lower jaw with five teeth including three molars and two premolars, was discovered for the museum in South Dakota, making the species known from four specimens. The discovery of a Oligocene primate was a little controversial, as how did primates survive in South Dakota, yet were not found to have survived the boundary elsewhere in North America? During the second half of the Eocene, the fossil record of primates in North America shows a decrease in abundance um, and diversity over time. Northern regions like Canada, Montana, Wyoming uh, show a drop in primate diversity, followed by Utah, Colorado, and by the last portion of the Eocene, primates are pretty much limited to the southern regions. Uh, places such as the Central Plains, Texas, and Mexico. So here was a primate living in South Dakota, and it appeared to have survived this climatic extinction. This was evidence to the contrary. So for the next um, 20 years, paleontologists dreamed of finding more of this rare fossil. Um, and the four specimens were heavily studied in the 1970s to discern if they were primates or not. Malcolm McKenna, curator of fossil mammals at the American Museum of Natural History, um, was less enthusiastic about the primate affinity of these specimens. Um, in 1990, he argued that the teeth belong to the Plagiomyidae uh, family. This is an extinct uh, group related to the Kalugu, uh, which is the Dromoptera. Uh, these are actually living mammals that are believed to be uh, closely related to primates. Um, they're commonly called the flying lemurs. They live in the tropical rainforests of Southeast Asia. In North America, there are fossils in the Paleocene and Eocene, uh, including a fossil called Wordlandia. Um, both Plagiomyidae fossils and living Colugos have tooth combs in their lower, uh, lower incisors. This is where the teeth are split into, these co into this comb-like appearance, and they're used for grooming the animal's fur. Um, and to protect their membranous skin that they use to glide from tree to tree. Now, no incisors exist for Egmu Wasashawala, so the idea was possible, but not everyone agreed. So it was not until another 20 years later that in 1983 um, that another specimen is found. Um, it was discovered in the early Oligocene John Day uh, fossil beds in Oregon. Um, it was an upper jaw, the maxilla. Um, this was problematic since the original four specimens were based on lower teeth. But when researchers compared the two, the upper and the lower teeth appeared to occlude with each other. The upper molars looked even more primate-like, and the authors of that paper, Ken Rose and John Rensberger, suggested that it was a late surviving 
Omamayade that made it through the Eocene Oligocene boundary. A mere seven years later, in 1990, an isolated tooth was found in East Texas in the early Oligocene Toledo Bend site in the Flame Fleming Formation. Um, its crenulated surface and arrangement of cusps appear like a left lower fourth premolar, similar to the South Dakota specimen, but differs somewhat. The last discovery was made in 2011. Uh, three lower teeth, a premolar, first molar, and third molar were found in the Oligocene John Day fossil beds, and it was given a new species name. Egmu Waswashawala Zancanelii, after John Zancanelia, a paleontologist with the Bureau of Land Management who had discovered the three lower teeth. The lower teeth match the occlusion with the upper maxilla previously found at the John Day fossil beds. The paper also reported a seventh specimen in the fossil collections in Kansas, a single upper molar from the Curring Formation of Nebraska, dated between 30 and 26 million years old. The John Day fossil beds are also well dated with radiometric dates, using argon-argon dating of biotite crystals found in volcanic ashes. The specimens are found in the Turtle Cove member with an ash layer dated at 27.14 million years ago. Clearly, all of these fossils are within the early Oligocene epoch rather than the Eocene, and dated to a very narrow interval of time from 30 to 26 million years ago. The four widespread occurrences represented by only seven specimens seems to indicate that this fossil primate was neither abundant nor common, but it had survived for several million years beyond what other primates had been able to do. The teeth are all that we have of this extinct creature, but teeth can tell us a lot. Egmu Wasashua likely ate fruit with its crenulated teeth. This wide basin tooth helped to crush pulpy fruit, and the crenulations may have prevented cavities with a diet high in sugar. The size of the teeth suggests that Egmu Wasashua um, had a small body size from 900 grams to 2,000 grams, larger than a squirrel, but smaller than a Northern Ameri North American possum. Egmo Wiswashwa did not have a long temporal range, living from around 30 million years ago to 26 million years ago, during the Arachirian age of the part of the, uh, the Oligocene. This is kind of kind of interesting um, since none of these specimens are found in the early Whitneyan uh, part of the Oligocene, in the fossiliferous Brule formation, uh, which is absent of these fossil primates. This gap in fossil primates has led researchers to suggest that these Oligocene primates may have migrated over from uh, into North America from southeastern Asia rather than necessarily being endemic survivors. So one of the ideas that has been recently pitched is that Egmu Wasashola um, is not an Omamayad primate, um, but more closely related to the Asian family of primates called the Shiviadepidae. The Shivlia Depidae are known from the late Eocene into the Miocene of Southern Asia. Like their North American counterparts during the Eocene Oligocene boundary, um, Asian primates also retreated into the tropical, more southern regions. Um, unlike North America, in Asia, there is an abundance of tropical regions that they could continue to survive within. Uh, within the tropical rainforests of Yunnan, Vietnam, Laos, Malamar, and Thailand. This region also included a refugia uh, for tarsiers um, and early anthropoids as primates as well, um, including some Miocene apes. Um, so the Shivliya Depidae are members of the Shrepshrine 
Adipa forms. Um, so they feature uh, fused um, deep mandibles, molarized uh, fourth premolars, and similar to eat leaf-eating uh, lemurs that live in Madagascar today. The discovery of some fossils from the early Oligocene of Southeast Asia include a fossil called Yungana adapis. Yungana adapis features three major cusps on the cheek side of the upper molars, uh, rather than just two. Uh, this extra cusp is also found in Egmo wasashua, um, but not in Washakius. But there's, there's some differences too. Another wild idea is that Egmo wasashua is not a primate at all, but an early relative to the Procyonid, the group that includes the uh, raccoons, the Kotamuda, the Kikaju, um, and the Aluria. This is a group that contains the red pandas um, and their fossil relatives. Now, these mammals are true carnivores within the order Carnivora, um, but their teeth, if you look at them, bear some resemblance to those of Egmosashula, uh, in particular red pandas, which have these highly crenulated and cusp-filled molars for crushing vegetation, such as bamboo as well as fruit. Now the group appears in the fossil record in the Miocene with fossils found in North America and Asia and in Europe um, and their origins a little murky um, but it would not be too surprising to find earlier fossils in the Oligocene. Now while it's a great theory there is one big huge problem. These are carnivores and they have elongated lower first molars due to their convergence and going from a meat eating diet um, to becoming an omnivore. The carnassial tooth still retains the, this elongated shape and the fourth premolars are not molar like. They look like other carnivores. So it is unlikely that Egmo Sasha is a member of this group. So there's really only three kind of valid explanations out there. First is that Egmo Sashala is a surviving Omomayad primate, a North American primate. Um, second is that Egmo Sashala is a relative to the living Kaluga. Uh, and the third is that Egmo Sashala is a uh, migrated over from Asia. Um, but there's this promise. Each of these explanations requires that the animal was able to survive in a much colder climate. Um, and if it migrated into North America, it undoubtedly would have to have crossed the cold land bridge through Alaska and into North America. And if it was cold adapted, then then why did it go extinct around 26 million years ago? And why don't we have more specimens? All right, since only a handful of specimens are known and they're only represented by fossilized teeth, it would be incredibly nice, really incredible, to find a complete skeleton of this rarest of rare fossils. Recent research is pointing toward an Asian immigration. Uh, with many new discoveries in southern China of Oligocene fossil primates. But the problems exist. How did this primate migrate out of the Asian tropics across a much colder landscape during the early Oligocene into a new continent and then survive over a wide geographic region only to disappear from the fossil record after a few million years. One thing that I find so incredible is that with each new fossil discovery we make, it leads to a new scientific question. But everyone, everyone has the same chance of stumbling upon a truly amazing fossil. You may spend your entire life looking for fossils in a place like Alfred and Walter, but never find that truly rarest of rare fossil discoveries. I think that randomness is what excites me the most about paleontology. The game, the, the puzzles, the, the science, you know, all that's great, um, but the endless quest 
uh, to make that incredible first discovery, it's, it's what keeps us paleontologists looking under every rock and pebble on the ground.